Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. So happy to see you all here. And this is our usual little quick segment on a Saturday morning where we just go through some stuff. So I thought it was something I came across. Um, I had a bit of a backlog getting through some material and MicroStrategy had a Bitcoin for conferences event. And one of the speakers was Fidelity. And they presented some very interesting information that I think should be shared, as well as some other information you all need to know about how institutions are coming for your Bitcoin. So this is a story about the silent whale you didn't know about, math, money, freedom, and it's about Saturday. Happy Saturday. So first of all, let's talk about Fidelity. Fidelity is the third biggest asset manager on Earth. Whoops, should blow this up so you guys can see. And... They have about four and a half trillion dollars in assets under management. Sometimes it's hard to understand exactly how big a trillion dollars is, but believe me, it's a lot. And uh, a couple of interesting things to look at when you look at the money that they actually manage for people from that four and a half trillion, $836.8 billion, nearly a trillion, is in money market cash. That is dollars debasing at 15% per year. And about 640 billion, nearly two thirds of a trillion dollars, is in bonds which are negative yielding. So that, call it 1.4 trillion, needs to find a home. And this is what the customers of the third biggest asset manager are looking for. By the way, sorry about the thumb. I sliced it on my disc brake this morning on my mountain bike, but it's spring, so hope you guys are having a good time. So this lady was speaking at the MicroStrategy conference. Thank you, Quiken. And her name is Christine Sandler. She's the head of sales and marketing for Fidelity Digital Assets. And she said something that blew me away. She said, we are a Bitcoin first company. That's big. Like I remember being at Facebook headquarters more than a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago. No, it was about 10 years ago. And everywhere you looked within Facebook, it was, we are a mobile company. To make that type of statement is flabbergasting and has severe impact. So let's look and dig into couple of things from Fidelity. One, if you check yesterday's video, I'll put the link up here. So you can see, I'll put the link up there. Um, you will hear me talk about Fidelity and the head of Macro. His name is Jurian Trimmer. And, you know, I talked about a lot of price prediction models yesterday, but this is a simple model that they use today with their clients. They see Bitcoin going to 100,000 by 2023. And that's based on Metcalf's law, which I covered in great detail yesterday. But I didn't get the slide until today. But this is based on the growth of the number of phones and the value of that network, cell phones, and as well, growth of the internet, number of internet users. So if you look at the $1 million target, if Bitcoin follows the cell phone trajectory, which Fidelity believe it will, Bitcoin could hit a $1 million by 2028. And I know people say, well, you're slinging hopium. But you got to remember, this is the third biggest asset management on earth. And this is their head of macro. And this is all he does. This is all he studies. And he is on the ball. So we'll see where we go. There is another get out of jail free card model, though, that doesn't bring Bitcoin to a million dollars until 2034. That is if the adoption follows the Internet. But remember, for those of you who are old enough to remember, imagine trying to get broadband in the United States in 1994. It was a six month process. It was extremely difficult to do. Uh, in 1996, it was probably like a four month process. In 1998, it was probably a two month process. In 1999, it was about six weeks. So really, really difficult to get. So watch that space. That is the trajectory we were following. And it could even be more aggressive as it's so much, everybody has a cell phone now. There's nearly 8 billion of them in the world, nearly one per person. And it's like any split to get some Bitcoin in your hands. So let's talk about what their decision was. So they faced a fork in the road way back when, and that was, should they focus on retail or institutions? Well, retail wasn't that easy because they couldn't do things like get spot ETFs, etc. So what they did was they launched their institutional and custodial services in 2017, and they onboarded their first clients in 2018. But they're doing very quietly behind the scenes. And remember, not all treasuries are public for all companies. Now, the other thing that they were doing very quietly is they were quietly mining Bitcoin since 2014. Again, this blew me away. Back in the good old days in 2014, well, was eight years ago, you could mine 25 Bitcoin in every 10 minutes if you had a lot of horsepower, of course. And here we are. Bitcoin is now just went up 100 bucks since I started. We're exactly 
as I can see here on my left. Okay, so what else do they do? They mine Bitcoin, they've got custodial services, they focus on treasuries and institutions, but they also buy miners. They own nearly an 8% stake in Marathon. Marathon Mining owns over 8,200 Bitcoin today, and they own nearly 8% of it. So 8,864, 640 Bitcoin from this asset alone is what they indirectly own. So, but let's go on, let's dig a bit deeper. They talk about when they talk to their clients, they talk in very simple terms because a lot of people are new to the space, not like you guys out there who are all gurus, but they have this thing called their virtuous cycle per fidelity, which is a good reminder for you all as well. But the more users, the higher the, the demand, which drives, brings and attracts more miners, which brings more security to the network, which makes it ultimately more attractive, especially to institutional investors. They want their assets to be secure. But there's more. They also market to clients and they talk about the how best to understand what Bitcoin is. And they, they think it's best to showcase it as a monetary good. Now, the big takeaway from this little chart here, which I liked, was uh, obviously econom economists and historians suggest the answer lies in a number of characteristics that make good money. But the more char characteristics a good possesses, the better it can serve as being money and the more likely it will be accepted as money. Now, let's look at what they did here. The real beauty is obviously the green boxes, the pluses are the features it has, and the dings are the orange. So compared to gold, obviously Bitcoin is new digital gold, the major advantage that they flaunt of Bitcoin over gold is it's divisible, portable, and verifiable. Gold misses the mark on all three. Boom, boom, boom. So for those of you out there selling gold, it's missing a lot of key features that are very important in this day and age. But let's go. Let's, let's talk about what changed over the last three years since they've been in this space. First of all, they are global. They work across the United States, uh, North America, heavy deployments in places like Canada, etc., um, Europe, and Asia. So they have their boots on the ground all over the world. When they look at the adoption, you can see here very clearly the adoption in the blue has exploded. And the blue, of course, is Asia. 71% is adopted. And you can see that the US in the green has been a laggard and light green. Europe has been a little bit faster, but not that fast. Now, when we look at the SEC 13F filings that we just saw in quarter one, it indicates exactly what the report in 20, late 2021 from Fidelity said. They expect a huge influx of institutions from the United States corporations in 2022. And there we are. I shared this, I think, on Tuesday last week. Hello, institutions, right on cue. This is the number of SEC 13F filings that mention Bitcoin per quarter, and it's gone up nearly 3x. And this is for asset managers that manage over $100 million in assets for clients. They have to disclose their equity holdings and other digital asset holdings as well. So remember, smart money's coming. Q1 2022, they're knocking on the door. And that going from 58 mentions to 160 is a huge explosion. Anyway, now what they also do, which is really interesting, digging into Fidelity. And remember, BlackRock are going to be doing the same thing. They just mentioned the same thing. Forget the spot ETF, but get this. Think Celsius for institutions or Nexo for institutions. Maybe MicroStrategy can fund part of their business by borrowing against the Bitcoin that they have. They have 125,050 Bitcoin. If they're not doing it with Alex Mashinsky from Celsius, maybe they're doing it with Fidelity. But that's another avenue. And Fidelity are already active in this space. So remember, you can do more with institutions than you can with retail investors. And there's less kind of <laughs> regulatory scrutiny for some of that stuff. Now, the other thing that's interesting is they're not only a Bitcoin-only shop. They like Ethereum as well because of what they call regulatory certainty. No other assets beyond Bitcoin and Ethereum at this stage. They are looking into the metaverse, but right now they're just focused on these two. And this ties in with our crypto compendium and quotes from Gary Gensler, i.e. the regulatory risk for these two assets is the least compared to all crypto. So let's talk about the spot ETF stuff. So far, they have not gotten approval, but they have ETFs, EDPs all over the world. They've got stuff going in Canada. They've got stuff in Europe. They have a physical uh, Bitcoin ETP, they call FBTC, uh, listed in the German exchange in Frankfurt and also on a bunch of exchanges in Switzerland and across Europe. And they also have a whole bunch of stuff going in in Canada. So again, it just shows you how far behind the US is 
and the regulators need to get a little little brush of cold water in their face to wake them up. Now, they did file for a spot ETF with the US SEC and they got rejected, but they keep chipping away. They haven't given up. Um, everybody's getting rejected right now. They're kind of in a holding pattern. I do still believe at some stage, hopefully this year, I did think June, but maybe a little later, depending on how things go, we should get Grayscale approved first, considering they have 650,000 Bitcoin. That's a big bag. So let's talk about institutional ownership and what's going on around the world, where the institutions are looking and playing. I thought this was very interesting. 46% of European companies have an eye to direct investment in Bitcoin. 45% of institutions in Asia have an eye and only 21% in the US. Now compared to Ethereum, that's 10% in the US, 27% in Europe and 22% in Asia. It's interesting because as in some other patterns they had, there was more interest in crypto and they've already jumped in in Asia for these types of assets. But in Europe, Ethereum is more attractive than in Asia. So I thought that was kind of an interesting one. Now the survey sample, this is an important thing to know about where the money will come from. So you have people like financial advisors pushing the assets. You have high net worth investors, as you know, I think I can't remember the exact number, but the top 0.1% of rich people own 40% of the world. Um, so, so that high net worth investors is a big chunk. You got family offices, very rich families, owning a ton of pensions, crypto hedge funds and venture capital funds, traditional hedge funds, endowments and foundations and so on. And they are the breakouts. So the top three, just to pull that in, the top three, as you can see, are the financial advisors, high net worth individuals and family offices. And they make up three quarters of the people sampled in the survey. But this was really interesting. The difference in geography by investor type and the interest in crypto. So as expected, native crypto hedge funds and venture capital funds have adopted at the highest levels, nearly 100%. That's compared and juxtaposed against financial advisors in Asia that are pushing crypto very hard. I thought that was super interesting. Places like Japan um, are extremely crypto friendly. Now, outside of native crypto hedge funds and venture capital funds, high net worth investors, financial advisors and family offices led adoption within all regions. And although you might assume that these firms native to the asset class would be 100% invested due to the nature of their business, we believe that their adoption in Europe, 86% and Asia, 53% can be explained by a few factors. There is likely a nuance in the classification of the investor segment throughout the world. So don't be put off by this, but it's interesting charts nonetheless. So the question is for everybody, this final point, Bitcoin, will the arrival of institutional money cause a price surge? And the answer is yes. And Kevin O'Leary said as much. He expects this money to completely change the game. So does Raul Paul. So do I. So do many others. So remember, if you look at Glassnode statistics today as well, you see that 80% of the transactions, 80% of the volume is institutional. Million dollar plus transactions. This is what's driving the market right now. So despite the weakness and uncertainty, just remember big picture, when the institutions come in, they plan for six, 12, 24 months before they actually pull the trigger. 2022, I believe is the year that they will pull the trigger. So if you're not subscribed and you want this cool content, jump on in and thank you for the likes and thank you for everybody here in the comments. And tomorrow is the weekly Q&A where I answer the top questions from you all. So thanks all, have a happy Saturday. See you soon.